Thank you for joining us for the Food Loss and Waste podcast. This episode will explore partner solutions to reduce food loss and waste, the cold chain. This podcast is hosted by the USAID Research Community of Practice Working Group on Food Loss and Waste, and will feature interviews with subject matter experts to explore the implications of and approaches to addressing food loss and waste. My name is Nika Larian, and I'm a AAAS Fellow in the Bureau for Resilience and Food Security Center for Nutrition, and the co-chair of the Food Loss and Waste Working Group. Today, I'll be speaking with Rusty Eason, a technical advisor with Bright House, working with Food Enterprise Solutions. Welcome, Rusty. Please introduce yourself. Thank you, Nikki. Um, my name is James Rusty, Rusty Eason. As she mentioned, I've been in the cold chain industry for 30 plus years now. Currently, I'm based in Oman and I'm working for Bright House Consultancy and Training in Kenya on with a uh, food enterprise solution uh, business for dri business drivers for food safety. I appreciate being here. Thank you for joining us, Rusty. And with 30 years of experience, you have a lot of insight to share with us. So we'll move into our first question, which is, can you explain the role that the cold chain plays in reducing food loss and waste? What are the most problematic issues? All right. Um, first, cold chain is described by, by me as any product that needs to be moved from one point to another uh, under refrigeration and cooling in any form. Um, so since fruits and vegetables need to be brought to its optimal temperature within the first few hours after harvest, it needs cold chain. This in turn, what happens is it extends the shelf life of this product typically by 14 to 21 days. Uh, the problematic areas would be mostly transport because it's the uh, weakest link in the supply chain. It happens most often in the supply chain, so you have to transport it from farm to collection center, collection center to processor, processor, and so on and so on until it gets to the end user. So that's the problematic area and the most likely chance of the cold chain being broken. With it being broken, it's actually worse than if it uh, never got into the cold chain because then it respirates even faster. So it needs to be a complete end-to-end -end solution when it comes to being refrigerated. Yeah, thank you for setting that that context and, and really emphasizing the importance of, of the cold chain and, and maintaining that cold chain during transport. So can you elaborate on what are some solutions that exist to those problematic issues? So there's quite a few solutions uh, globally um, for re refrigerated transport, small vehicles. Um, I've seen tuk tuks uh, transformed into refrigerated vehicles. Uh, storage, uh, solar cold storage uh, solutions who are in the end now, they're doing uh, small electronic vehicles for transport. ISM in Africa does this in Nairobi. They also provide pre-cooling and processing and storage in a small unit for uh, a one-stop solution for the farmer. Uh, you have EcoFrost in India that's doing somewhat the same thing. They have a, a refrigerated uh, solar powered coal storage that actually is mobile that can be put on back of most transport vehicles in uh, India to move it from one farm to the next farm. So there's quite a bit of solutions out there, uh, some cheaper than others and price becomes a focal point. Well, you teased my next question perfectly. So now that we have an idea of some of the solutions, of course, the, the next question is, okay, now what, how do we, how do we implement them? So can you make the business case for the profitability of cold chain technologies and how do we get people to invest in and implement them? Yeah, this is the part where I should be rich. Uh, <laughs> so profitability, uh, larger cold chain companies um, in more developed markets, it's a lot easier to do so. In the developing world, emerging markets, um, farmers being disfragmented, um, product producers or processors are not uh, pr predominantly everywhere. Uh, they handle large areas of supply chains under one processor, which can also be dangerous, but that's for another topic. But it, volumes has to be key to profitability on cold chain. So the smaller solutions, you're looking at between five to 10 tons a day and, and it begins to be profitable. For the farmers, 
that they consider a, a, a an off taker who provides the logistic solution and uh, profitability uh, center basically because they got an off taker near the farm. They don't have to have a lot of cost involved. What the cold chain does is add the 20 days of shelf life to it and it gives them a better opportunity to sell the product. They don't have to harvest as, mu as much. It extends the shelf life, the monetary value of the product and also the nutritional value. Um, so it's a win-win situation. I believe it's uh, cold chain adds about 23% on some of the studies to the cost of the product. But the return on that is typically anywhere between 10 to 12% above that is what the, the quality causes the product to be worth more. And the shelf life extension gives you more opportunity to sell it. So yes, it can be made. Thank you for making that case. Yeah, of course, of course, if we want to get them to invest in these technologies, they they have to see a benefit on their end. So thank you for, for making the case for that. And thank you for sharing the context of the importance that cold chain plays in, in food loss and waste and describing some of the potential solutions that are out there. So thank you so much for joining us today, Rusty. No problem. Anytime.